What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Sports Huddle. This is episode three, the Sports Huddle podcast brought to you by Six Rivers Media, the only locally owned and family owned media outlet in the region. I'm Dylan Young, joined by my friends J.D. Vaughn, Jeff Birchfield, and Andrew Smith here. And guys, it's hard to believe, but we're already in week three of Tennessee high school football. And we're going to talk about, you know, the games of week two and what what's ahead of week three. And I think the story for week two was you were either punched out by lightning, canceled by lightning, or you were on the wrong side of a blowout or the right side of a blowout, depending on who you were. So we're going to get into that, all that in, into this episode. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Lazy J Farms, Old Fashioned Butcher Shop, for sponsoring the show. Lazy J Farms has been raising the finest cattle and all natural pork for three generations on the family farm in Fall Branch. Their blonde Aquitaine herd offers a leaner, healthier, and more tasteful beef. And the butcher shop is local, farm to table, and 100% authentic. This is the way your grandfather shopped for me. With steaks cut to order, quality assured, and ready to ship to your door. Open Thursday through Saturday on Bloomingdale Road in Kingsport. Come see us. One game that Lightning did threaten, but they did get it get it played that night was uh, Greenville and Dobbins Bennett. J.D., you were there. Greenville kind of showed what they were about this year. We talked a little bit about them on episode two last week and what they were bringing in, all those guys from that last year's uh, semi- state semifinal team and how they could give Dobbins Bennett problems. And Dobbins Bennett did have problems against Greenville. What would you see? Well, you know, up until last night, I thought 2021 might have been Eddie Spradlin's best team. You know, this team very well – could, could top it based on what I saw. I mean, some guy named Carson Quillen, maybe you've heard of him. I mean, he, and six plays into the game Friday night, he goes to the house on a 65-yard run, and that's all the points Greenville ended up needing because Dobbins Bennett offensively very limited, uh, only 20 yards passing the entire game. So kind of uh, – now they got their running game going with Corday Moore and Parker DeFord and, and Austin Sykes, of course, as well. But just – with Tegan Begley and Trey Wyndham both out for the foreseeable future, and they will be out again this week. Uh, Dobbins Bennett was just very limited at what they could do against Greenville. But, you know, you have to attribute a lot of that to Greenville because Greenville is just so good. They're so fundamentally sound on defense. Eddie Spradlin, a defensive-minded guy, they do not miss tackles. I mean, there, there was one particular play uh, where – Dobbins Bennett had a screenplay set up, had three blockers, one Greenville player came all the way across the field and made the tackle after about a three- or four-yard gain. So that, that just tells you just the discipline of how good Greenville is and how deadly they can be on offense, too. Carson Quillen and quarterback Caden Ball both go over the 100-yard mark. Uh, Dobbins Bennett just they, – they get inside the red zone once, but, of course – they they came up short. They came up one yard short. Kind of just overall, obviously a disappointing night for Dobbins Bennett. But if it's any consolation for Dobbins Bennett, they're probably not going to see a team that good again until possibly Science Hill or, or possibly a deep playoff run this year. Possibly Elizabeth, and you don't know. But just that that's going to easily easily be one of the toughest games Dobbins Bennett has this year. So just. It's it's just a measuring stick, and now it's just back to the drawing board this week as they get ready to take on Westridge. And this game is going to be a good one because it's about county pride. It's about respect. It's about can Westridge make the move up to where they want to be, and can Dominus Bennett maintain its dominance over the county schools that it's had for more than three decades now. So just – a, a big week ahead for Dobbins Bennett for those reasons right there. Yeah, and that 35-0 to zero win for Greenville, it really just shows you kind of how complete that Greenville team really is on both sides of the ball. You mentioned Carson Quillen. I read in your story, J.D., you know, he would have had 300 rushing yards and four touchdowns if they didn't have a 60-plus yard or like a 70-yard run called, uh, called back for, for a penalty. Well, it, it was all for naught because Caden Ball ended up scoring on the very next play or, yeah. or maybe a couple plays later. I can't really remember, but uh, still, it, it was it was just that kind of night for Greenville. Yeah, and, and it really shows that Dobbins men, they're really going to have to take that next man up mentality. They're already thin. They were thin going in uh, playing Greenville, and they're going to be thin again this week, you know, with those injuries still. And they got a big game against Westridge to open up conference play there in Region 1 6A. And with speaking on Westridge, Andrew, you were at the game of Westridge versus Daniel Boone this week. 
pretty good matchup coming into the week, but Westerners just kind of showed what they were about this year, beating Daniel Boone 42-7. to What did you see in that game? I mean, I think the big uh... – Big thing for West Ridge is they were able to control the line of scrimmage. Uh, whenever I talked to Coach Hilton after the game, he said, wherever you play Daniel Boone, wherever you play a Jeremy Jenkins coach team, the line of scrimmage is going to be the biggest key in the ball game. They were able to do that. Ethan Amix, one of our players of the week this week, had over 100 yards rushing and two touchdowns. And overall, West Ridge ran it for almost 250 yards. So – the question was, could West Ridge control the line of scrimmage? Offensively, absolutely they could. And a big turning point in the game actually was the special teams. They were late in the first quarter. Daniel Boone, long drive. They tie up the game at seven on a fourth and goal from the one. Ensuing kickoff, Caleb Mab takes the kick 83 yards for a touchdown. And from there, the, the onslaught was on. You could feel the momentum just go right back to that West Ridge sideline. And they just took advantage of it, pulled away in the second quarter, didn't need to do much in the second half because they were already up three scores at halftime. And, yeah, it was just a very dominant uh, display from Westridge. And we talked about last week how Trey Frazier really showcased his ability to throw the ball in week one. He didn't need to do that. It was more more traditional Westridge, run the football. Trey Fa- Frazier was perfect on the day, but he only had seven pass attempts. Didn't need to throw it much. And, and Trey, when I talked to Trey after the game, he was like, yeah, I mean, I definitely don't mind those kind of games where I can just kind of let the offensive line work, let the special teams do their thing. And, yeah, it's obviously a big win for West Ridge. I think this is probably the best chance they've had as a school to break that county win streak over dobbins Bennett. We talked about that from the dobbins Bennett side. This is a West Ridge team that's confident. They're physical. They can play, uh, They can swarm uh, defensively. Uh, it's really impressive to see so many blue hats just swarming to the football against Daniel Boone on Friday. And, yeah, this is a very dangerous West Ridge team in Region 1-6A. Yeah, and that was a game that started off close. It was 7-7, to and the West Ridge just took off from there. And especially, you know, you mentioned those two kickoff returns. I mean, that's electric. You know, yeah. I think, a, you know, a kickoff return or a punt return, that's just like the most electrifying play in football that you can have. And it really just sucks the life out of your opponent. And you kind of see Daniel Boone there kind of struggle to get back in that game. What do you think of receivers Caleb Mab and uh, Dylan Bennett? I feel like those are two dangerous receivers that Trey Frazier can really use uh, out there in the in the field. Yeah, and obviously Caleb took back that kick return, able to showcase his electricity there. Didn't really get to showcase as much uh, skill set on the outside, but we talked about that kickoff return, very electric with the ball in his hands. And, uh, you know, Trey Frazier had a 44-yard touchdown in there as part of his seven pass attempts, and uh, it was uh, to one of his receivers. And just a little quick hit trout and just ran right after the catch ability for a good 40 yards of that 44-yard run. Uh, so overall, I mean, yeah, it's a very um, – Deep receiver core, I would say, with the Wolves. It's not one that, like I said, they had to showcase much of on Friday against Daniel Boone. But look for him to make some more plays this coming Friday against the Indians of Dobbs Bennett. Yeah, and for this Daniel Boone team, you still they're still trying to find the rhythm on both sides of the ball, especially yeah. on that offense led by sophomore quarterback Cole Stevenson. And they have a really, really big game uh, this week coming up. We'll get to that later. But first – We'll go over there to Scott County, Virginia, where I was at last Friday. Gate City beat Richland's 20 to zero. It was Gate City's first back-to-back wins over Richland's to open up the season since 2008-2009. So really good win for them. Uh, really good win for the Blue Devils there. They control this game in the trenches. Offensive line, defensive line. Uh, let's talk about the defense first. The defense held uh, Richlands to 79 total yards and only had five first downs in that game. They Richlands did rush the ball 22 times but only accumulated 13 rushing yards. That just shows you that defensive line for Gate City was just smothering that Richlands, uh, the Richlands backfield, just getting back there, stopping you know all the momentum that Richlands would try to gain there. The first uh, first drive of the game for Richlands they spent most of the time backed up against their own uh, goal line there. And that was pretty much the story of the night for Richlands. They couldn't get anything going. And, you know, credit to the Gate City defense for making that happen. I mean, they were all over the ball there. Then you flip over to the offense, and you got one big name. Walker Hillman had 26 carries for 236 yards and added a touchdown in there. And, again, I think it goes back to the trenches. The offensive line was just creating holes for Walker to run through. And, you know, he was finding the holes really well, reading the field very well. And, and as soon as he hit uh, as soon as soon he hit open field, man, he was gone. Uh, he put some speed on, had some power in that game, and really showcased what he might be able to do uh, this year as a junior 
senior for Gate City last year. He just had barely over a thousand yards rushing, you know. And after one game this season, he's already one fifth of the way there to a thousand yards. So not a bad way to start this season for Walker Hillman. And also want to talk about Corey Bird, another running back. Uh, he he gathered just a little over ninety yards, and most of those were on one play after Gate City got backed up against their own end zone. Well, about they were on at their own fourteen yard line. Uh, Corey Berg took the handoff and dashed 86 yards to the house. Man, an electrifying touchdown there for the Gate City to be up 14-0 there in the third quarter. And then quarterback Jackson Jones finished off the scoring for Gate City uh, to go up 20-0. He had a little one-yard touchdown run. And that quarterback situation, I know we talked last week about who the starting quarterback for Gate City was going to be. They had Caden Houseright, the sophomore out there, to start the game, but there in the first quarter, Caden went down with an apparent leg injury and never came back in. Not sure about his uh, his injury status there. He was on crutches after the game, so not sure how long he will be out, but Jackson Jones did come in, the senior, and he finished out the game, quarterback them the rest of the way. Like I said, he had that one touchdown, and he did a pretty good job, but you know, it kind of does change your game plan when you plan to start with one quarterback and you've practiced the whole week with him with being Caden Housewright in Gate City since and then you got to come out and throw another quarterback fortunately he was a senior and it seemed like he was you know pretty ready for the moment and he didn't really have to pass the ball a whole lot because the Walker Hillman and the offensive line got it done for them and Gate City opened up week one of Virginia High School football with the win there and that was a really good win for Gate City so we talked about Lightning canceling other games in the area, postponing other games. Jeff, your game, Science Hill, Anderson County, we were really looking forward to that matchup. Great 6A versus 4A matchup. I mean, is there anything to talk about with Science Hill and Anderson County other than just Lightning uh, ruin it for us? Yeah, I mean, just uh, really disappointing, you know, because like you said, it's looked at to be a really good matchup, good test for both teams. You know, in these non-conference games, I mean, that's a lot of what they're doing, getting the teams ready for league play like that, you know. So uh, I ended up doing a story about the Science Hill girls basketball players, some of the legendary players getting their jerseys retired that night and then uh, going in the office and helping – round up some of our other games, but unfortunately that one got uh, canceled. So did, you know, Elizabethan at um, uh, Morristown West and then Happy Valley Unicoy. They made it to halftime and it was seven to six at halftime. Really good ball game going on. But the coaches decided, you know, to call that one a no contest because a lot of times fans will wonder, well, why do they do that? But it's sometimes hard to get, you know, everybody on the page as far as rescheduling a game like that. Yeah, and another game that got – postponed until Monday. They had some Monday night football over there in Carter County. It was Johnson County over at Hampton. Uh, they played, well, I guess, like one drive there. And uh, Johnson County went up 6-0 to zero on Friday, and they suspended the game and finished that out on Monday night. Uh, on Monday night, Hampton went up 8-6 to six to start that uh, – to resume that game on Monday. But Johnson County in that triple option offense, they showed what they were about, winning that game 41-8. to eight. Do y'all got any thoughts on that game that y'all want to throw in there, the uh, Johnson County winning 41-8 to over Hampton? I mean, to me, that kind of came as a little bit of a surprise to me personally, knowing the way that Michael Lunsford li- uh, wants to run that Hampton program. He preaches physicality. He preaches the line of scrimmage. And to see Johnson County go into J.C. Campbell Stadium and control the line of scrimmage like they did on Monday night, it – it's a bit of a shock. Uh, I think it says a lot about what this Longhorn team can do. Uh, obviously, I got to see them in week one against Sullivan East. But uh, even now, being able to repeat that and have another dominant offensive performance like that, look out for the Longhorns the rest of this fall. Man, that is a very talented, very impressive triple option offense. Yeah, J.D., I think you mentioned during the off season that Johnson County could be a dark horse in that region and you're kind of seeing it on display now through two games. Did you? I mean, did you see that? You know, before the season started, with what they were bringing into the off season, how they were effectively they were running that offense. It's that offense is always a question mark because it can run really well if you know what you're doing, but if 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 it's taking some time, it can be a struggle if you're just adapting to it. But it's clear to me, two games in, Johnson County has already won two games that it lost last year: Sullivan East and Hampton. This year, the Longhorns are two and zero, and I got to tell you, the the ground game. It, I mean, nobody stopped it yet. So look out for the Longhorns. I mean, Longhorns and Gatlinburg Pittman. That might be a good game. Johnson County and Unicoi County. Whoo, we got some that we got some good football ahead of us with Johnson County. 
Yeah, for sure. And then Hampton, of course, they're still trying to find their rhythm and get right on the season. We're not really used to seeing them lose 41-8 to like that, like we saw against Johnson County. Uh, flipping to Cherokee and David Crockett, the comeback kids from, you know, a week ago, and they went into this game unbeaten, both getting week one uh, wins under their belt, and one of them had to lose, and it turned out to be David Crockett this week. Cherokee 35, David Crockett 21. Of course, quarterback Landon Jeffers leading the Chiefs there uh, for a victory. Y'all got any thoughts on that game right there? Well, uh, Cherokee, don't look now. Cherokee has won six of its last seven games after starting 0-5 uh, last year. This year, the Chiefs are 2-0. and So if that, if that just doesn't tell you how far the Chiefs have come this offseason, I don't know what does. Landon Jeffers, like you said, leading the way. He's much more mature now. And not to mention, you know, physically he's gotten a whole lot bigger uh, this offseason. And – and senior running back Hayden Hook, of course, with the touchdown to put the game away, cracks the century mark on the ground. Uh, the Cherokee Chiefs, uh, they got a big one this week. They got Greenville coming to town. So look out for them come playoff time especially. Yeah, and Cherokee, I guess it could still be considered a comeback win there. They were down 13-0 to to start the first quarter against David Crockett. You know, Crockett opening up the game, uh, opening up the gate, uh, running wild there with A.J. Wynn and LaMarcus Dunn uh, having a few, a couple rushing touchdowns there. And Cherokee just able to get themselves back in it, make big, big defensive stops and just, you know, slowly uh, or just gradually score and add to the scoreboard there. And eventually, uh, I think Cro Crockett was – in the second half, they were driving the ball and ended up fumbling it there at midfield, and Cherokee recovered. And after that, it was just all Cherokee. They went up, they went ahead with a rushing touchdown there, and never looked back and won that game, 35 to 21. Uh, we'll go back over to Scott County, Virginia football. Of course, week one over there, um, really impressive game by Rykov, who crossed the border to play Hancock County. Uh, of course, they beat Hancock County 62 to six there, and quarterback Landon Lane. Okay. I'll, I'll, gi I'll give you three guesses as to who was behind that Rykov offense. It starts with Landon and ends with Lane. Uh, basically, everything Rykov has done for the past couple of years, it goes right through Landon Lane, and why shouldn't it? The guy had, ha had over 100 yards rushing and a over 100 yards passing, eight total touchdowns. Holy cow. Yeah, he touched down is a lot. I mean, when you see – I, I saw the box score that head coach Gary Collier sent, and it, it said eight touchdowns. And I was like, are you serious? He scored eight touchdowns. Yeah, four on the ground and four through the air. And, I mean, it, like you said, that, that offense just runs behind Landon Lane. You know, they just follow his lead. And his receiver, Luke Jesse, caught three of those, uh, three of those touchdown passes from Landon Lane. And then you go over to Twin Springs, another Scott County team. They opened up with a shutout. Twin Springs 27, Northwood 0. Uh, Julian Pascual had 20 carries for 147 yards and a score in that game. Scott County, Virginia, week one was really good. I mean, 3-0 and there for Rock Cove, Twin Springs, and Gate City all opening up their football seasons with wins there. All right, now we're going to get to our sports huddle game of the week. But before we get to that, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Lazy J Farms Old Fashioned Butcher Shop, for sponsoring the show. The Lazy J Farms tailgate box offers great value all season long. Get 40 pounds of meat for only $110. That's 5 pounds of beef patties and 3 pounds of chicken breasts. 1 pound of thick cut bacon, 3 packs of premium beef hot dogs and 2 packs of Chicago dogs, and 4 pounds of thick cut pork chops, all for $110 at Lazy J Farms Butcher Shop in Kingsport. Visit us online at LazyJBeef.com. For the sports huddle game of the week this week, no other. Guys, this is a really, really good one. The 54th edition of the Musket Bowl between David Crockett and Daniel Boone. This year it would be played in Jonesboro. Guys, you've been a part of this. You've seen this. Jeff, you've covered this game. Talk about what – Talk about the history of this game, just the history of this rivalry first. Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to cover quite a few of these games, you know, over the years. And uh, just like you said, tremendous history there. Of course, uh, the two schools uh, people are named after actually have a history in Washington County. Like there's the famous deal where Daniel Boone killed a bear, C-I-L-L, B-A-R. He carved on a tree in Washington County. Of course, David Crockett uh, – live down there close to um, Nolichucky River, you know, where the David Crockett birthplace is. But as far as the schools themselves, rivalry didn't start off that well for Daniel Boone. Crockett won 74 nothing the very first 
game in the series. But since then, Daniel Boone's come back. You know, that actually has provided motivation. And Boone's had, you know, the upper hand for most of the rivalry. The last few years been a little more competitive now that uh, Hayden Chanley, who actually played for Jeremy Jenkins at Daniel Boone and uh, as the head coach there for a long time, you know, since he's been at Crockett, it's been a pretty close rivalry, you know, the last few years. And, uh, of course, last year Daniel Boone got a little bit of the upper hand, was up 35 to nothing in that one. But I look for this year's team. Both teams really needing a win bad, and I think it's going to be a really competitive game this year. Yeah, this uh, especially this week, I mean, they both open up conference play with each other, Region 1, 5A. So for Daniel Boone, they started out the season with two losses. This is a game where they can win and get right, and they've controlled, you know, the last three games in this uh, in this rivalry game, and they can win this game. It could really turn their whole season around and get some confidence under those guys. And as for Crockett, you started off 1-1, one one, but you haven't beaten Daniel Boone in the last three years, so you're trying to figure out how to, you know, get a musket bowl win under your belt and keep the season going on a good note. What you got yeah, for well, us, J.D.? Well, I mean, Daniel Boone, they've been outscored 98-7 to seven the first two games. Who cares? It's the musket bowl. Yeah. And so this is a good this is this is, this is the one oppor- this is Daniel Boone's opportunity to turn their season around, get back get up back on the right foot. Same thing for Crockett. Um disappointing loss last week after after blowing a two touchdown lead. Uh and his chance for redemption in the past few years at David Crockett. And last year this game decided who got in the playoffs. It could decide that again this year, especially with the way Sevier County played this past week and their win over Jefferson County. Um, we got a long way to go until we get get to that game, obviously. But just with with the way Sevier County played, I got to think that this this Musket Bowl game is going to have a lot. It's going to carry a lot of weight come playoff time. And just we just with, with the way these two teams have played, they both need this game badly. And, and you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. TWSWA, please. I hope to God you're listening. Move this game later in the year. The leaves aren't changing yet. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it's week three, and we're talking about the musket bowl. We should be talking about this at the end of the year with bigger implications. Even though there's big implications this year still, and, you know, every time that they meet, there's always big implications. But the with it being at the end of the year just brings just, – it gets juicier, you know. It just adds a lot to, to the musket bowl and that rivalry and to whether or not you're going to make or miss the playoffs of both of those games in the hunt. Now, this game can still determine the playoffs, you know, down the road. If you have this one loss, whether it be Crockett or Boone, it could be the one loss that eliminates you from the Class 5A playoffs uh, at the end of the football season. Andrew, you've got to spend a little bit of time around Crockett and Boone a little bit with their media days. What do you got for us? What are you looking forward to in this game? I, I think for me the big key is which young quarterback can step up and make plays in a big game like this. You've got two sophomores behind center, uh, Cole Stevenson for Daniel Boone and A.J. Wynn for David Crockett. Uh, A.J. has already shown, especially in week one, his ability, his poise uh, to lead a comeback, to uh, spearhead an offense when they need it the most. Cole hasn't had a chance to do that yet. So, yeah, in a game like this, when the lights get bright, you need that guy who's behind center to go and make a play, potentially go win the ball game for you. And I think both guys have the talent to do that, um, even though they are both very young. I think they both are very talented young quarterbacks that have that ability. But can they go do it in a big game that we talk about? Could mean a lot for the playoffs come uh, Halloween time, even though we're not playing it at Halloween anymore. Uh, but – uh, it's 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 going to be big. It's going to be big for both those young quarterbacks and their development to learn how to win in a big game like this. Yeah, everyone's looking forward to this game on the schedule this week. All right, let's hear from Crockett head coach Hayden Chanley before Friday's game. It's going to come down to execution. Um, you know, they do some things really, really well, especially up front on both sides of the football. And we just got to execute. You know, we got to identify what kind of front they're in defensively and make sure we get a hat on a hat. And then defensively for us, you know, we just got to maintain our gap, read our keys, flow to the football and tackle well, which uh, we need to improve on from the last two weeks. And hopefully we do that Friday. All right. Some other big games of the week. We talked a little bit about it earlier. This is another another really, really big game. Uh, Dobbins Bennett and Westridge. Of course, Westridge goes over to Dobbins Bennett to play this game. Westridge is 2-0 and to start out the season. Dobbins Bennett 1-1. J.D., you're going to be covering this game. What do you got for us? Well, 
Not since 1993 has a Sullivan County school defeated Diamonds Bennett. If you're wondering, it was Sullivan South, the eventual 4A state semifinalist Sullivan South. The final score was 33 to 7, and the game was in Death Valley. You know, this game at Diamonds Bennett this week, this is going to be about, like I said earlier, respect. It's going to be about West Ridge trying to make the move up to the level of Diamonds Bennett, and it's going to be about Diamonds Bennett trying to maintain their superiority over the Sullivan County Schools and trying to stay in the conference race. And the loser of this game is already falling behind and playing catch-up, so you kind of get Tennessee-Florida feels from the 1990s where the winner has, is in the driver's seat and, and controls their own destiny and the, and the loser has to play catch-up the rest of the year and, you know, hope for things to happen. But, you know, this game, we got, uh, you know, West Ridge last year, and they still do it this year, with a quarterback like Trey Frazier, they can run two different offenses in the same series. I mean, just because just because they're so equipped to do that with guys like Trent Tatum at tight end, uh, who, of course, moved off the offensive line. We've touched on that before. And Ethan Amex in the backfield. And here's what Joey Christian had to say about trying to prepare for two different offenses. Well, or trying to. It's, it is. It's first uh... – First round of region play, you gotta, you know, you gotta come out on top of the region play. So, you know, everything we've done before, everything we've done and haven't done before now, uh, you know, don't matter. So these are the games that matter for for sure. You know, this is a game where I mean, you got guys that live in the same neighborhood and go into different schools. I mean, you know, your your the, the school footprints uh, uh, crossover. So you got guys, especially, you know, especially in the Colonial Heights and in the, uh, you know, some of the Bloomingdale uh, top that uh, uh, or, uh, neighborhoods, you know, crossover where they could go to either school. So I don't know if there's uh, a respect or, or whatever, but there's, uh, you know, like you said, I think you're right on pride, and I think they're so well coached. I think that Coach Hilton and his staff do such an uh, incredible job and you know like you said you have to prepare for two offenses and you can't I mean there's not enough time in the week to fully prepare for two offenses uh, and like you said they'll go from four wides it'll be three by one four wide and the next play they're in there shoe to shoe uh, double tight double wing and, and running uh, wing T power type stuff uh, so that that's a that's a tough uh, that's a tough order uh, Dobbins Bennett, once again, they're going to be, sh they, they've been shorthanded all year. They're going to be shorthanded again this week. It's kind of just the theme of Dobbins Bennett's year so far. They're going to be without Tegan Begley and Trey Windham again this week. So once more, they'll call on Corday Moore and uh, Parker DeFord to lead the way in the backfield. Quarterback Austin Sykes, of course. Uh, like we said, threw for only 20 yards last week. Peyton Franklin, the tight end, a major factor against Farragut in week one. Obviously, Greenville. Uh, keyed on him last week so you know and Dobbins Bennett they most of their passes this year have been short stuff just short screen passes dump offs short crossing patterns things like that we haven't really seen Dobbins Bennett air it out and go deep so will we see Dobbins Bennett go deep this week that's going to be a, a key for the for the Indians this week and now we're going to and for and on, on the flip side we, when we got uh, West Ridge can, can the Wolves get over the hump? Because last year the Wolves, we, we may remember, jumped ahead to a 14 nothing lead. Dobbins Bennett responded with 41 straight points. Dob Tylen Taylor with uh, 10 catches, three touchdowns, just a monster game last year in Bluntville. So for the Wolves, it's a matter of getting over the mental hump and getting up to the level of Dobbins Bennett, making that that important move if they want to be taken seriously in the Big East Conference. And here's what Justin Hilton has to say about this week's game. Well, we want to get ourselves back where we were that first year. We want to host a playoff game. You know, I mean, this program, the expectations need to be we're going to be in the playoffs. We need to be fighting for a home playoff game. And to do that, you've got to beat teams like Dobbins Bennett, Science Hill, and Jeff County. So I think it's just as much about standings and getting yourself in good position in the conference early on. Well, obviously, it starts with the quarterback. He's such a good runner. You know, they're, they're banged up right now. So when we've seen them, it's been with a lack of running backs. So the quarterback grabs your attention because he can go score on any play. Uh, and I feel like against Farragut, they were just taking what they were giving them. You know, so maybe they're not just throwing it short all the time, but that's what Farragut was giving them. So they were kind of taking that. Um, you know, we don't know what to expect at running back because we don't know who's going to be back and who's not. But uh, 
we're going to be prepared as if Begley's going to be back there and ready to go. And, uh, you know, he adds another dimension to the game because he's got a lot of speed. You'll see us in both offenses. I mean, you'll see us get in and out of them and, and move around. You'll see uh, Trent at tight end and at tackle. You know, he's he's multiple. We're going to do what we feel like can make us successful. And we do need to get guys in space and give them the ability to make plays. But that's easier said than done because you, you still got to block that front forward that they got. So. Um, you know, how's our offensive line going to hold up? Are we going to be able to run the ball enough to open up the passing game? I think those are all questions that are going to be answered throughout the game. So Dobbins Bennett, Westridge kickoff 7 o'clock at J. Fred on Friday night. This one ought to be a good one. It's about pride. It's about respect. And speaking of pride and respect, Science Hill and Jefferson County, uh, you, you, it's been a long time since we've said this, Science Hill against defending conference champion Jefferson County. So there's a lot on the line in this game, Jeff. Yeah, the other Big East Conference game middle of the week, there's going to be really a good matchup. Last year, Jefferson County won 25-21 over Science Hill. Good news for Science Hill is uh, Jeff County graduated at running back Amaria Mills, who was player of the – year in that league but the problem is Skylar Thomas has come in he's another good back you know that Jefferson County's got but you I asked Stacy Carter you know the biggest concern and it's just the pure size up front of that offensive line they've got two players with uh, Nick Moore who's committed to the University of Tennessee he is six foot three 307 pounds and the other offensive tackle is Grant Arnold and he's a little guy compared to him just 6'4 300 pounds you know little <laughs> so you know you've got the rest of that line's 275 256 253 so I mean those huge offensive line you know for the high school level well they're huge I mean that would be the big thing they're you know like the old Jeff County teams that were in the 80s I mean there's some big kids especially on the offense and defensive line and uh and uh, they have one kid committed to the university of tennessee and a couple other big huge kids and strong kids and uh that's the thing that kind of jumps off the page you look at the depth charts you look at the weights and the heights and uh and they're physical and they've always been physical so uh it's gonna be a tough game yeah, another game in the area, of course, is a 4A game, is a volunteer at Sullivan East. Both teams starting the season out 0-2, so one of them is going to walk away with a victory in this one, you know. And this is a this is a good game for those young squads to really test uh, test out each other in this conference game. And quarterback Peyton Lingerfeld still trying to find his groove. He did a little better against Tennessee High, of course, when – the scoreboard's not going to show it against Tennessee High and Sullivan East, but he did look a little better in that game. So coming into volunteer, going up against that young volunteer defense, trying to find his rhythm there with the air raid offense on Sullivan East. Of course, the last year, uh, the last time volunteer went to Sullivan East over there in Bluff City, they came away with a victory, 35 to 13, but have lost uh, both games after that uh, against Sullivan East. So trying to break that two-game losing streak, volunteer is heading into Sullivan East this week for that Region One. 4A matchup there. Uh, so, of course, we got a lot of other games uh, on the schedule for week three and week two of Virginia High School football, and we'll try to catch it, catch up with those uh, next week on next week's episode. And you can also check out johnsoncitypress.com and timesnews.net to catch up on all the stories and the football action in the Tri-Cities and Scott County, Virginia area. So read up on those stories, get a glimpse at week three, take a look back at week two and some of the details that happened there. And we appreciate you all for joining the Sports Huddle Podcast brought to you by Six Rivers Media. Thank you all for tuning in. And catch you all next week. Lazy J Farms has been raising the finest cattle in all-natural port for three generations. Our Blonde Aquitaine herd offers a leaner, healthier, and more tasteful beef that ships from our store directly to your freezer. This is the way your grandfather shot for meat, only now we wrap it, seal it, and send it right to your door. We have plenty of options to pick from, and they're all fresh and natural. Just visit our website at LazyJBeef.com and choose your package. We'll get it straight to you.